guys hear me? Test, test, test. There we are. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, man, Pastor Rick said I'm close to the heart of God. I think I'm winning. You know, after the Lord, your senior pastor says that. Yes, the prayers have been working out. But like he said, my name is Amir. I'm one of the pastors here alongside my wife, Bethany. And uh, we get to oversee an internship program for, for college-age men and women. They serve the church. We invest them as the best. And I get to help recently oversee our weekend serve teams. And Man, let me tell you, we have solid gold people who serve in our church week in and, and week out. Uh, I want to introduce my family. My, Beth, my wife, Beth, is on the front row, and our son's in Little Life. He's two years old, so I'm going to show a photo. I'm not going to pull Dax out of class. That'd be weird. This was Mother's Day a couple weeks ago. Uh, that's my wife, Bethany. Bethany and I will celebrate five years of marriage in about a month and a half. We've made it in life. I'm just kidding. We didn't make it. we got a long journey ahead. Actually, tomorrow, we're going to go on an anniversary trip tomorrow. So I'm here to preach, and then I'm out, okay? So it's going to be great, but I'm excited to be here. And I, I want to draw attention to Dax because he smiles like this all the time. If we can go back to that photo, I want to I point out he's got a comb over. And uh, I like to call him Mr. Big because he looks like he's six with a comb over, you know? Uh, and he's this joyous all the time, my little brown boy. And I actually got a story. I wasn't planning on saying this, but this happened last night. Just to look into toddlerhood, if you will. Beth was, uh, I was watching some basketball, and Beth was about to give Dax a bath, <laughs> and so she took off his clothes, took off his diaper, and he ran out, you know, because sometimes they go rogue at that time of the night, and uh, I was watching TV, and he runs in, little naked boy, and I said, hey, buddy, he said, hi, and then he's just looking at the TV with me, and I'm watching TV, and all of a sudden, I feel a warm sensation on my feet. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Never happened. I looked down, and for about two seconds, he peed on my toes, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, Beth, and then he got scared because I wasn't trying to correct him because was so innocent, but I was like, you just peed on me. And then our dog's coming over to smell. And I was like, Beth, Beth. And I'm just trying to watch the basketball. And uh, I was like, it's okay, but we pee in the, and he doesn't, we haven't potty trained. I was like, we pee in the bath, you know? Like, we don't pee here, we pee in the bath. Um, so I uh, wiped off my toes, and here we are. I slept great last night. So that is uh, Parenting 101. I can't make it up. And we love uh, being parents a lot. I'm really honored to get to speak to you guys this weekend. Uh, thankful for the opportunity from Pastor Rick and Pastor Hunter. Uh, but I do want to say, like, this message that I want to share with y'all has probably came to get together different than any other message that I've gotten an opportunity to speak. And um, just the topic has just been on my heart for a long time and uh, really since last fall, almost like just marinating, like, a, like some delicious food in a crock pot. I mean, I love a good crock pot meal, you know what I'm saying? And I never intended on speaking about this. I think sometimes as pastors, we'll, we'll see things in the world or we'll get into the word and we're like, man, I, I never thought that. And a couple weeks ago, I was asked, hey, would you be willing to speak today? And I, I was praying and I knew this is what the Lord wanted, to, wanted me to share. So this weekend, I want to talk about unity in the body of Christ. And I even want to talk specifically about how to have unity in times of division, because what we're going to see shortly in the words of Jesus, this is something that was very, very, very important to him. And we're going to see some scripture where this is something he literally prayed for us. But let me be the first to tell you, it's hard to have unity in this day and age. Let me give you an example. I don't know about you, but about 70% of my Facebook friends over the last year have become experts in infectious disease. They have no training. They have no background. But all of a the sudden, they'll tell you everything you know about masks about vaccines, about the virus on both sides. And they'll even tell you when you're wrong and they're right. Isn't it a beautiful thing? And you're just like, wow, I feel so united to you because you just all of a sudden know everything there is about COVID. Or maybe the past couple of weeks you went to get gas and you saw a site like this. Let me show you a photo I have that's um, just real life. Now I know this, this photo isn't great quality. It was a little humid outside, but I, I pulled to this gas station and Pastor Hunter was getting some gas. I said, Hunter B's at, what are you doing? I'm just kidding, I don't know if we have a Seneca in Conway. Guys, this is like eight Home Depot buckets. Last time I checked, Home Depot buckets don't have lids. <laughs> Lord knows how that man got home without smelling like a gasoline fire. But imagine if you pull up to the gas station and you see this man, and you know, sometimes when we're at the gas station, we're in a hurry, and after his eighth bucket he's filling up, you're thinking, oh dear Jesus, I'm trying to go. I don't really feel united to this man right now. This is hard. This is hard, but it is real life. Joking aside, I know it's hard. I know this is a tough topic. Uh, and even if we look at our country today, we're living in some divisive times. But not just in America, in Arkansas, in our communities, uh, countless things can cause division this last year and a half. The pandemic, uh, race, politics, kind of always. Other areas, some would say, sadly, we're the most divided faith group in the world. Denomination after denomination, after split, after split, after split, and we're supposed to represent Jesus. But even in saying that, let me encourage you with something this weekend. 
that this won't be the last time we're going through times of division. When I was growing up as a kid, there was things going on in our world. There was things going on in our state. Some of you that are older than me, there was things going on 40, 50, 60 years ago. And there's going to be things that happen in the future, but Jesus' heart that would be united. And that as the body of Christ, we've done it before. And come on, church, we can do it again. Amen? This is not a surprise. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to face trouble, but fear not, I've overcome the world. I think that's important to know. So two things I want to say before we jump into the scripture that are important to know. One, I'm not an expert in this area. Man, I've made my fair share of mistakes, okay? But I do want to tell you, I've grown so passionate about this topic, praying through it so much, talking about it with the people close to me, talking about it with people I don't, that are different than me, looking through scripture. And my heart is just to give you a biblical perspective on unity uh, and encourage you with God's word. The second thing that's important to know when we talk about unity is that unity is not uniformity, okay? Unity is a simple definition is, is uniting or joining things together. Uniformity is being the same, uniform, identical even. And oftentimes a common misconception is that as believers, we're supposed to be uniform. We're supposed to think the same, look the same, act the same, talk the same. When rather when we look at the word of God, so the scripture shows us that we're different people with different gifts and different ages and different races that choose to come together in our differences to be united as the body of Christ. We're going to be different from each other, but we choose unity. Think about this. Those of you parents that have more than one kid, your kids are different. They're not uniform. They're not cookie cutter. They're all different and unique and special, but as a family, y'all come together united as one. So unity is not uniformity. That's not the heart of God. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John 17. If you have your phones, John 17, we're going to be in verse 20. And I'm going to teach it from the screens, but I would love for you to follow along in your Bibles. I'm going to be reading the NIV. I want to give you some context that's so important, though. In John 13 from John 17, Jesus is with his disciples, and this is the night before he be killed. he's going to be killed. And he's teaching them things. John 13, he washed the disciples' feet, it's the Last Supper, and then he proceeds to teach them things, things that he hasn't taught them before, and pray things over them the night before he knew he was going to die. And that's significant. Imagine, and Jesus knew this, obviously, but imagine if in a crazy way you knew you had one more night to live, and your family and best friends were at a dinner table with you. What would you say to them? What would you pray over them? That's right here in John 17. So what we're about to unpack is so significant because Jesus could have said anything, and this is what he chooses to say in John 17. Isn't that awesome? So let's look at this together. John 17, verse 20. I'm going to read this. It's just three verses, and then we're going to unpack it, okay? This is the words of Jesus. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. He had just prayed for the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world will believe that you have sent me. I have given them, next slide, the glory that you have gave me, that they may be one, there's that word again, as we are one, I and them in you me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then, here's the promise, the world will know that you sent me, talking about himself, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. I have read this before and just kind of gone right by, but I want to show you some su such important things. If we'll go back to the slide before. Jesus says, I pray for those that will believe in their message through me. That's us. That's people before us that have called upon the name of Jesus. That's going to be people past our lifetime. This is Americans. This is people all across the world. Church, aren't you thankful because what Jesus did on the cross, millions upon thousands upon people after this prayer have called upon the name of Jesus. He's praying for us. So many times in scripture we can say, hey, how do we apply this to life? He is praying for us right here. That's so important to know. What does he ask? I pray that they may be one. This word one in the Greek is the word heis. Almost sounds like heist, you know, like a robbery. Heis. This word has two really important definitions that, that complement each other. Heis means to be opposed to a division into parts to be more closely united together. So Jesus prayed, could have prayed anything, he prayed, I pray y'all will be more united closely and you would oppose division between yourselves. That's what I pray for you. And I underlined it a few times for emphasis, he uses that same word four times in this prayer. 
Would you be united? Would you be united? Then he takes it a step further. Not that we would just be united as one. He says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, what does that mean? Jesus boldly says, not only do I want y'all to be united, I want your unity to model me and the Father. Think about the unity in the Trinity. Think about how close Jesus is with the Father. They're inseparable. His heart is to do the will of God. He's always talking to me. He says, hey, you, my followers, I want your unity to be like me and my dad's unity. That's more than just getting along. That's more than just tolerating people. This is so powerful. He said, I want y'all to love like we love each other. Next slide to point out. He says that he will give us his glory. Well, what this means is referring to is that as, as followers of Jesus, he's laid his life down for us. We're forgiven. We're set apart. We're made holy. We were given the grace of God. We're given the spirit of God. What Jesus did on the cross, amongst many things outside of forgiving our sins, he reconciled us back to the God. He made a way when there was no other way. And as Jesus followers, we all have that in common. But what do we tend to do? We tend to get so fixated on our differences that we minimize maybe the greatest thing, if not the greatest gift on God's earth, Jesus laying his life down for us. So church, I know we're gonna be different, but God says, I've given you my glory. Let's not minimize that, amen? And this is how he finishes the promise. Then the world will know that you sent me and that I have loved them even as you have loved me. What Jesus is saying is, hey, if you keep this perfect unity, the world will know that the Father sent me and I will love them. Think of it this way. If we don't keep unity, it's as if the world's gonna miss out that the Father sent Jesus for them and that Jesus loves them. Wow. I wrote it down this way. Jesus' believability is based off our unity. So we play a huge part in this. So how do we keep unity? Unity in times of division. Some of you are thinking, can we do that? I think so, because I think Jesus would have never prayed for us if he didn't believe we can do it. But I think what he wants, especially in times of division, is for us to closely unite, not be so quick to divide. So I wanna give you three points, real simple, New Life Church fashion, of how do you have unity in times of division? And I wanna say this too, this is for the body of Christ, but man, everything I'm gonna encourage you with in that prayer of Jesus, you can apply this to your family. Those of you who are married, those of you who have kids, this is unity within our family too during hard times, amen? So if you're taking notes, number one, the first point is we gotta renew how we see people. Renew how we see people, talking about unity. I think it's important to develop values and convictions for your life. You didn't know what you believe and why you believe it. And the hope is, and even our hope as some of your pastors, is that these beliefs and convictions are founded on the word of God, infused with the word of God, and honor God. But it's so easy during these times of division to get caught up in all that's going on, we start to see people differently. We can see people less than. We can see people as our enemy. We can get to a place where we think our primary role is to critique people, and even get to an extent where we hate people, rather than our role being to love people and to have unity. And let me be quick to say, the love of Jesus is full of truth and grace. Yes, sometimes love means we confront. Sometimes love means we challenge, but there's a difference in the life-giving confrontation and just critiquing people just to critique them. And that's what we can see sometimes in our culture. We gotta remember that we gotta see people the way Jesus sees them. In Genesis, Jesus says that, man, man and woman, they were made in our image. He actually speaks to the Trinity. People are made in the image of God, whether they're believers yet or not. So the Pastor Rick's pastor always teaches us, Pastor Larry, is that people aren't our enemy. That rather in Ephesians 6, there's a spiritual warfare going on and that we don't war against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities. But what the enemy wants you to do is to see people as your enemy. One of the the first value of our church is we believe in the value of a soul. Meaning we gotta get to a place where we see the soul of people and don't get so caught up in making a point that we devalue the person. Look at this scripture in Ephesians 4, 22. Man, Ephesians 4 talks a lot about the unity of of Jesus. I wish I could read it all, but this verse is so good for renewing the way we see people. You were once taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil, deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in the true righteousness in holiness. The Bible's often talk about how we gotta renew our mind in the same way in these times, we gotta renew the way we see people. 
Let me tell you a story. A couple years ago, uh, I got asked to speak at one of our campuses. One of our campus pastors were out of town, so me and Beth went to go help. And we were standing on the front row, much like right here, and worship was about to start. The worship team was on there. There was a countdown, and we looked to our left, and we happened to see, like, one of our close friend's mothers. And I remember I didn't see her name. I just said, oh, look who it is. And Beth's like, hey, I'm going to go say hi to her, and walks over there to go say hi. Well, Bethany walks up to our friend's mom and says, hey, and she says, hey, how are you? And Beth says this. Beth says, hey, I'm so glad your son has got connected to the college ministry in our church in Conway. Well, Beth then realized in the moment that 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 woman wasn't one of our college student's friends. It was actually one of our best friend's moms. (laughs) And that woman looks at Bethany and says, my son, I don't have a son. I'm so-and-so's mom. Don't you remember? And in that moment, the worship, the, the drum starts going, do, 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 and worship comes on, and the woman walks away, and Beth's just standing there, like, it's so distraught. And so Beth's walking over and has these big eyes, and I'm looking at her like, what just happened to that? I didn't know if that woman, like, shared a prayer request or something. And she said, babe, I am so embarrassed. And I was like, what happened? And she said, I thought that was so-and-so's So-and-so, but it was one of our best friend's moms. And I was like, oh, that's awkward, you know? And worship's going on, and as soon as the woman spoke, Beth realized, ooh, I saw her in the wrong way. And my sweet wife never makes mistakes. This is like the first time in her life she's ever made a mistake. It was awesome. I was like, yeah, I was kind of like happy, but I shouldn't be. Okay. (laughs) And, And I think some of us, I know that's a fun story. We need to have a moment like this with people, but rather where God reveals, hey, you've been singed in the wrong way. Hey, I think your eyes and the eyes of your heart have gotten a little distracted. I think we need to renew how we see this person and those people, no matter what's going on around us. Amen, church? So with all these, I want to give you some practical application. How do we renew how we see people? Well, I think it's easy. I think when the Holy Spirit convicts us, if we feel kind of off in this area because that's one of his roles, if we get so caught up in the division, we just pray, hey, God, would you forgive me? I repent for seeing the people this way, whether it's one person or a group of people. And then even like the worship song we just sang, I didn't know we'd sing the song, you just say, hey, God, will you give me fresh eyes to see your people? Jesus is often described that when he would see the crowds and multitudes, he had compassion on them. Jesus, will you give me eyes of compassion like you have? Even if I disagree with them, even if I don't understand, will you help me see your people like you see them? Then it would be easier to have unity. Then we would be a light to non-believers and have an opportunity to influence them with our unity. Amen, church? So one way, we got to renew the way we see people. Number two, we got to maintain a pure heart. Talking about unity in times of division, we gotta maintain a pure heart. I don't know if you know this, but your heart requires maintenance, kind of like your car. Sometimes with our cars, we do proactive maintenance. We uh, obviously, I hope you put gas in it, change the oil, get new tires at times. But how many know sometimes your car will start acting up? And you got to give some attention to it. Sometimes your car will break down. How many of y'all love when your car breaks down unexpectedly? No one in the world. It's the worst thing ever, especially when you're in a rush or on your way to work. And in the same way, like our hearts, our cars need attention at times, our hearts need that too. Because this is the reality. One of the hardest parts about going through a time of division is that along the way we're going to get offended. We're going to get challenged. We're going to get discouraged. We're going to get hurt frustrated, you name the emotion. There's so many different things that could happen at a heart level, and it's hard, guys. But sadly, it's part of it. It's part of the challenge. Well, my question for you today is, hey, when you start to feel that kind of way, that emotion, what do you do? Do you fuel it? Just fuel the anger. Fuel the hurt. Just frustrate. Do you suppress it? Just kind of keep on going. It's no big deal. I'll get by. I I know I'm frustrated that person. I know I'm really hurt. It it doesn't really matter. Because what you'll end up seeing is if we're intentional to maintain a pure heart, we'll end up in places we don't intend to emotionally. We'll start to treat people different. We'll have a harder time being ourselves. We get defensive and bitter easier. We are slower to give grace and forgive. Why? Because the condition of our heart. This is why Proverbs 4 says, hey, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. One translation says your heart is a wellspring of life. We got to maintain a pure heart. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Pastor Rick has often taught us this. Hey, the Bible doesn't say don't get angry. No, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. 
You're going to feel these emotions. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get discouraged by someone. But what do you do? Do we, do we seek God and maintain a pure heart, or do we give the enemy a foothold to work towards division? I know what some of you are thinking, but Amir, I get frustrated with some people because they're dumb. <laughs> and the things they say are crazy. <laughs> Maybe so. I got some yes in the front row. That's good. Maybe so. But what are you doing to keep your heart pure? But Amir, they identify with a different political party than me. How can they be a Christian and believe what they believe? I don't know. You can try to figure that out. Maybe you should talk to them. But how are you keeping your heart pure? But Amir, they hurt me. It's their fault. Hey, I'm not trying to minimize the hurt you've been through in these times. And if someone did, I'm sorry. But what are you doing to keep your heart pure? That's my question for you. Because ultimately, we're not responsible to keep other people's hearts pure. We're responsible to maintain a pure heart for ourselves. And we can't always control how these things happen and what we see or what we take in or what happens in our world or what happens in our family. But we sure can control our response to it. We've got to maintain a pure heart. So how do we do this? One way our pastors have taught me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a feeler, I'm an emotional guy, so this has helped me so much over the years. One way is just to keep short accounts. I want you to think about that. When we start to feel a certain way, rather than suppressing it, rather than avoiding it, we, we gotta be quick and intentional to deal with it as it comes at a heart level. Rather than letting it stack up and stack up and stack up and stack up in this issue, in this relationship, this issue, and it just makes a tower of things in our heart. No, we need to be quick and intentional to deal with it. We're going to keep a short account. We're going to maintain a pure heart. This could happen a lot of ways. For example, it could be confessing to God maybe a way you've mistreated someone. Man, David cries out in Psalm 51, I believe, man, create me a pure heart, God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. We all for sure got to go to God to help with a pure heart. Maybe it's remembering how much you've been forgiven. Maybe it's processing with a trusted person. You've been going through something hard or something's really challenging. That's okay. Find a safe person. Talk it through with them. Maybe it's forgiving someone. Could be having a conversation with someone towards reconciliation. There might be a relationship right now in your life that's not going well. And the way you need to maintain a pure heart, you need to make a phone call. You need to get coffee with them. It's so hard. I mean, what will I say? Well, I don't know, we can pray through it. But God desires so much that your heart is pure for yourself and even towards that person. We've got to keep a short account. And we'll realize during these times of division, or really any time we want unity, man, if we can maintain a pure heart, it will help us be unified together as the body of Christ. Amen, church? Number three, last point, we gotta be wise with our words. You knew it was coming. We gotta be wise with our words. We're gonna renew the way we see people. We're gonna maintain a pure heart, and now we gotta go to our words. I think the easiest and fastest way to lose unity in our world is with our words. I've been amazed in a bad way and discouraged of how I've watched, heard, seen Christians speak to each other and to non-believers. We can be so quick to disrespect, insult, speak in absolutes, even get to a place where we hate people. It's just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch. I can't imagine what it does with the heart of God. And let me say this, guys, I know we're not gonna be perfect in this area. I told you I'm not as well. There's grace for that, but my goodness, it's like at sometimes there's no filter anymore. There's no wisdom. We just say whatever to some people sometimes. We post whatever. And as Christians, we're called to be set apart. We're called to be different. I know it's hard, but as believers, we gotta be above reproach in this area. Let me coach you uh, on something in life that you may not realize happening. And maybe not all y'all struggle with this, or maybe we're in a bad place. But when we're not wise with our words, you know what will end up happening? You're gonna lose influence with people and the right to speak in their lives. Well, what do you mean, Amir? Well, whether you wanted it or not, one of the things that comes with a Christ, being a Christ follower is people are gonna pay attention to your words and your actions. Well, Amir, that's not fair. Well, it wasn't fair what Jesus did on the cross with us, but this is part of being a follower of Jesus. It's just part of it. And we represent him with our words, but what's gonna end up happening is when we just say whatever we wanna say and don't really care who, who hears it and we say however we want, we're, we're not wise with our words. I'm not saying don't stand up for things. I'm not saying don't hold on to your biblical convictions, but there's gotta be wisdom. What ends up happening is there's gonna be a time when you wanna say something, there's gonna be a time when you wanna speak in someone's life and you're gonna have no influence to do it. 
no one's going to listen because we were foolish with our words. Ephesians 4.29, I used to have this verse on a note card next to my nightstand the first year I was a pastor because I was so foolish with my words sometimes with people. So I get it. I love this verse. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This word unwholesome in the Greek translates to rotten or worthless. Don't let any worthless ma- words come into your mouth. Woo. 2 Timothy 2, 23. This is a spicy scripture. Just warning you. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. Whew, that's hard. Able to teach, not resentful. That goes back to the heart. If you want to know where to find a foolish argument, go online. Pick your favorite social media outlet, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Go in the comment section of a divisive topic and watch how crazy it gets. I'm not saying the topic is foolish. These topics are very important. These topics are about people. These topics people care about. That's not what I'm saying. But the people in the comment section get really crazy really fast. It's like an online dumpster fire. You like know you're not supposed to look at it, but you can't look away. And you're like, man, these people are kind of going crazy, tearing each other apart. I need to get out of this post, but this is kind of entertaining. It's not good. Foolishness with our words. And you know, when I was preparing for you guys, something that is so strong in my heart with this point, a huge concern I have just as a believer, let alone as a pastor, when we're not wise with our words, I think we've gotten to a place as a culture where we make comments way more than we have conversations. We're just quick to make comments. Did you hear about so-and-so, Amir? Can you believe they posted that? Why haven't they said anything about this? How can they be a Christian and believe blank? In our circles, with our friends, coworkers, comment, 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 comment. Get online, comment, comment, reshare, comment. We're just so quick to make comments. There's a time for comments. But when reality is, man, maybe what we need more than anything is conversations with people to understand, to learn. Hey, I don't understand this. This is what I see in the Bible. And you, you're a believer. You seem to see something different. Hey, let's talk about that. Will you help me understand? And sometimes you're going to get to a place where you agree to disagree. Rather than just seeing what they, hearing what they say or seeing what they post and just writing them off and say, hey, did you see so-and-so? Comment. It's hard. How do we be wise with our words? I was reminded when I was preparing for you guys something Pastor Rick's taught us uh, that is so powerful when we talk about our words. He says, hey, there's three words you have to remember during these times. You got to pause, ponder, pray. When you feel something rising up inside of you, you want to say something to a person, maybe you want to post something, pause. Take a deep breath. (laughs) Let your emotions settle a little. I know you're challenged. I know you're frustrated. Think about it. Hey, is what I want to say to this person going to tear them down or is it going to build them up? Is it going to move towards unity or division? And let me say this really from the bottom of my heart. I am not saying don't stand up for things. I'm not saying don't hold on to the word of God. It's not, but it goes back to the phrase, it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it. You can stand up for Jesus and you can stand up for your values and you can stand up for people in a life-giving way, not a way that tears people apart. Pray about it. Jesus, would I wanna say, or nowadays, would I wanna post, would this honor you? Or would it discourage you? Could it bring you glory? Pause, ponder, pray. And when we have wisdom with our words, man, this is such an integral ingredient to have unity, especially in times of division. And let me wrap up the message with this. Just to be real with you, not to discourage you, in the last year we can see in our communities, you can see statistics online, more and more Christians are walking away from the faith. I think many non-believers are looking at the body of Christ and saying, man, they're so divisive. Why would I want to do anything with them? And it just makes me think, I wonder if the enemy is somewhere smiling, twiddling his fingers, thinking, man, I can't defeat them, but man, I can divide them. They're turning against each other. This is awesome. I don't even need to do anything else. And I know some of y'all are thinking, is that all our control? Is that all our fault? Can we influence all that? No. We, We can't save anyone or 
It's not all the, our reasons maybe people are leaving their faith, but that we do play a part as the body in Christ to influence people, believers and non-believers. Imagine if we could fulfill Jesus' prayer in John 17. We started to see people differently. We started to maintain a pure heart. We started to have more wisdom with our words. The promise would be is what Jesus said. Then people will know that Jesus was sent for them and that he loves them. And he wants a relationship with them. And he wants us as his body to be close, united, standing together, opposing divisions within us. Amen, church. Will you bow your heads? I'd love to pray for y'all as we close up. We're going to go back into worship. But when I was preparing this message, I got, I, I got a picture that I want you just to, to visualize right now as you pray. I want you to imagine two buildings. And in between these two buildings, there's a road that connects them. One building is unity in the body of Christ. The other building is division. And I want you to think, where am I at on this road? Like picture yourself. And I believe the Holy Spirit's already speaking to you. Are you someone who, and we're not perfect, but to the best you're doing, are you moving towards unity? Is your life, your family's life walking towards that building or are you more walking towards division? Because what I have felt very strongly to pray for y'all as I'm preparing this message, and I'm gonna include myself in this prayer, is that I think many of us have gotten off track here with the craziness that's happened in the world, the confusion in our world, the hard times in our world, people being mistreated, so much challenges, but maybe you found yourself in a place with man and mirror, I've been more in the divisive camp than the camp of unity. And if that's you with every head bowed, I'm raising my hand, I just feel like the Lord wants us to pray a prayer of repentance and that we turn away from the divisions, whether, whether it's justified, whether someone hurt us, and I know all those things are hard like we said before, but I, I want you to turn to that and we gotta walk towards unity again. If that's you with every head bowed, I just want you to raise your hand. Hey, Amir, there's been times in the last year and a half with my words, with my actions, with my thoughts, it's been divisive. I see you, I just wanna make sure I see you. And if you feel uncomfortable, raise your hand in your heart because we play a role in the body of Christ. How we see people, the condition of our heart and our words. You can put your hands down. Also wanna take the opportunity to pray before I pray over y'all like we do every weekend. Man, if you're in this place and you don't know where you're at with God, maybe you're like me, you didn't grow up in church. Maybe you just started coming to church or coming back to church. And while we talk about unity so much is what I said earlier, when Jesus, we believe, was the son of God and he laid his life down for us, we got grafted into this family of believers. And maybe you're, you're trying to figure out unity, but you're not in this family yet. Jesus Christ died for you. He, he paid for your sins. He did something that no one else can do. He was the perfect uh, sacrifice for the Lord so that we can be restored to the Father. We can be in relationship with God. We can have unity with other believers. So if you're in this place and you're not right with God, I wanna give you an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus. The one who enables us to have unity the one who renews our heart and our mind and our words. So with no one looking around, if you need to make a decision to follow Jesus for the first time or maybe rededicate your life, will you just slip up your hand? I just wanna pray for you before we go back into worship. It's the best decision you'll ever make in your life. Amir, I believe the Lord is asking me to make a decision to follow him. And make sure I see you before we pray. Man, we're so proud of you guys. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for lifting up your hand. Anyone else? It's the best decision of your life. Man, you can put your hands down. I'm so proud of you guys. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you that you could have prayed anything over us the night before you were gonna be killed. And you prayed that we would be united as you and the Father are united. I pray we don't take that prayer lightly. Lord, help us be united in your name as believers. And I pray our unity would be a testimony to the outside world. That, Lord, even in our differences or that we disagree or we don't even understand each other, sometimes we can find a way to find unity again. Would you grace us to do that? Would you enable us to do that? By your Holy Spirit, would you help us to do that? Would you help us see people different and, and pr have a pure heart before you, Lord, and really just have wisdom? We could be people who speak life with our words and build people up. And then we would be kingdom builders because of this. And the body of Christ would grow and people would look to us, not as a perfect people, but as a people unified under your name who love you and love them. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Church, we love you. Thank you for letting me encourage you guys. Will you stand to your feet? We're going to worship God one more time as we end up service.